So for me, I was, I was really excited to get asked to talk about marketing. I get super passionate about this. I mean, I get, I get stoked about our industry, but the reason is because I, I love what we sell. And so because of that, I love talking to people about what we sell. If you get me alone at a bar or a barbecue with someone, they're gonna hear about a fireplace. It's, Eric's laughing at me. Yeah, no, he, he won't stop. I won't stop. <laughs> If you love what you sell, then getting to talk to people and getting your message out, you should be exhilarated. You should be seriously stoked on it. So my thesis on marketing is really, really simple. I've got it right here. Um, your message plus their attention equals marketing. Nothing more, nothing less. If you have a great message, you don't have people's attention, it's not marketing. If you have people's undivided attention and your message is horrendous, it's not marketing. That's all it takes. Uh, I didn't come up with this. Smart people did. <laughs> uh, but you, we really need to be thinking about each side of the coin when it comes to marketing. And a lot of the time we can get super focused on one or the other, but, but both sides are needed, are needed just as much. So what we're gonna do as a group is we're gonna tackle these one at a time, spend some time talking about attention, spend some time talking about messaging, and then we're gonna get into, okay, how do we make a practical marketing plan and what are some, uh, some steps that we can take? Sound good? Okay. So, uh, messaging. We are gonna talk about good messages, and bad messages, and then we're gonna talk about knowing your audience specifically. So we need our messaging to give value to consumers, right? When we're, when we're crafting a message, we need to make it about them. You know, we, we've talked a lot today about giving power back to your consumer, that, that we need to make everything we do to better their buying experience and make it easier. So our messaging needs to be crafted towards them as well. So whenever we're messaging, we always need to make them the hero of the story. We, we need to keep that in mind as we craft the message. It's so easy to fall into a trap talking about us, but we need to make them the hero of the story. So when it comes to messaging, there's really two sides to it. So you could go for a direct response sales approach, a, a DR attack, where you have a call to action that's hard and fast, super easy to track, it's just a, it, it, it's a good hard sell, right? So you'll see a, a TV commercial or radio ad, you know, this fireplace is 500 bucks off, but only through the weekend. Or you know, mention this ad to save. That's fine, in the right context. But a direct response attack like that can get really tired really quick. And if your brand hasn't built up credibility with the consumer, it's super easy for them just to feel like you're a gunslinger <laughs> and, and you're a commodity if you make everything all about price. We talked about that a little bit earlier in discussions. Uh, <clears throat> so, good messages are all about the consumer and they give value. Abraham Lincoln said that. Yeah. No, he actually didn't. <laughs> but here is a direct response sales. This is this is from a car ad. You know, Black Friday clearance sale. Special offer, you know, finance without fear, no payments for 90 days. It's, it, that's, that's, it's a typical direct response sales ad. It's not, not anything wrong with that necessarily, but that's, that's what they're going for. It's a hard and fast call to action. There's a time and place to do that. The other side of the point is branding. Branding tells your story. You guys know the story of Les Schwab? Mm -hmm. What is it? He was a cattle rancher in Central Oregon, and uh, yeah, from, from my address area, right? Prineville, Prineville. Prineville. Okay, there you go. And uh, I know he was a cattle rancher and got into the tire business and all over the West, and he used to give free beef. I remember. Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> Look, if there's one thing that Les Schwab stands for, what is it? Free beef. Free beef. Okay. How about, how about a second thing in there that they're known for? Tires. Tires. Right. Now, is Les Schwab known for some of the cheapest tires? Gunslinger, best price in town, will match anything. Nope. No. no. They, they, Les Schwab sells value. Mm -hmm. And they have crafted a brand that's, that's a value yeah. brand. It's not a commodity brand like we talked about earlier, right? So branding is something that we really need to be thinking about. But what's tough about branding is that it's the long game. You, you can't track it. There isn't necessarily a quick ROI, but branding is how you persuasively set your customers up to be sold to. So branding messages are gonna tell the story of your company. Maybe they're gonna showcase the value that past customers have seen. And they're also gonna educate a consumer into your image. And what you're doing is you're persuasively setting them up to buy from you. <clears throat> and anyone in the family business should be hitting this like crazy. The branding story is amazing. I mean, just like Les Schwab, we, we love hearing the story about that. People love hearing the story about family businesses that are making it, right? It's the American dream. 
So <clears throat> as you set to market yourselves and you craft messages for your consumers, think about that branding piece, right? Not everything is a direct response, hard and fast call to action, but set yourself up to be a brand that is ingrained in the customer's minds, right? When they think about fireplaces, when they, when they think about value, they think about you. <clears throat> I want to take a look here at two things. So direct response versus branding both have places when it comes to marketing. And it's really important to have a mix of both. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of branding. I think that if there's a side we need to err on, I think it's the branding side, but there is a time to give a call to action and say, hey, this is a time to step up to the plate. Now is when you can save money. Now is when you can get this value. Um, <clears throat> but what I want to contrast between the two is that think about a brand as a, as a jab in a boxing match and think about a call to action, direct response on the right hook. So there's this guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. He's just a, a brilliant marketer. And he, he talks about that, that marketing is a boxing match. You can't be throwing right hooks all day. You, you get way too tired, people see it coming. So you need to set your customers up with a lot of careful jabs. Jab, 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 set them up for the sale, and then you throw a right hook. So this is an example, <coughs> pardon me, I'm fighting cold, but this is an example of um, Home Builder X that builds super, super high-end homes. And this is a Facebook post, and I think it's, I think it's an incredible jab. Um, What's right here is an amazing contemporary linear open fireplace. Now, it happens to burn biofuel and ethanol, which you can argue whether that's good or bad, but for the purposes of the picture, it looks incredible. It's super, super nice. So this guy builds homes, but this Facebook post is just, it's just a careful jab. Biofuel fireplace from our Hidden Meadows remodel. Burns clean fuel and requires no venting. That's the Facebook post, right? He's not saying, find my house, I'm the best, I've been around forever. Work with me. He's showing you something that's awesome that of course comes with this package. You know, he's inherently saying, yeah, buy from me. But he's not throwing a haymaker at you. He's giving you a careful jab saying, hey, did you know that you can get a fireplace that doesn't require venting that burns clean? I think it's a really, really good jab attack. Um, here's another one. This is uh, an Instagram post. Picture of a fireplace. It's got a nice little caption. My wife doesn't think this is romantic at all. Not. It's not a right hook, it's a jab. It's a jab. The idea is something that's going to show some personality, tell the story of your company. You're not sitting there asking them to throw down $5,000, but you're working with your customer to build the brand. Um, there's definitely a time and place for right hooks. I mean, I think, I think in our business, especially with some of the seasonality of it, um, winter's a great time to be throwing right hooks. Man, if it's cold outside, if there's incentive, um, it's a time to give a call to action hard and fast, get people in that store. And there's, and there's times and reasons to do it outside of winter, but one thing that I would think about a lot as you craft a marketing plan is figure out the stories of your company, figure out the branding of your company, and what are some ways that you can just jab, jab, jab away to build credibility with your consumer. And then you throw the right hook when you feel like you're ready, when you've earned that credibility. Um, <clears throat> next is, is an awesome ad. I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen this, it's so good. So this is a local hearth dealer out of the, I think they're actually in Washington DC and they ran this as a Super Bowl ad. Have you guys seen this? The hearth company did. It's an unashamed right hook. And it's like, for me, I'm so sick of getting right hooked by car companies and stuff. I just, it turns me off. But like this right hook is so self-aware, it is, it is brilliant. So let's see what you guys think. Oh wait, no, no, I'm sorry. This is, this is a job real quick. We'll, we'll come back to this. Here's the right hook. We'll see if the video goes. Maybe. Maybe. Hold on, I'll pull it up a different way. Washington is so cold. I thought Russia was cold. Mr. President, come on in. It's so warm in here, it reminds me of Palm Beach. And each one of these is up to 80% off. Joe, hold on, I gotta tweet this out. This is an amazing deal. This sale is huge. <laughs> you know, Joe, you're a winner, I'm a winner, everyone's a winner. We have excitement here. I mean, that's awesome, right? So good. I don't care what side of the fence you're on. That's awesome.
So, um, you know, that's an unashamed right hook. They said, hey, we're gonna go big and we're gonna, we're gonna make an awesome right hook that's totally self-aware. And I don't know what kind of business they got from it, but I think, I think it's terrific. Um, I wanted to throw this up and uh, I apologize for it being a bad picture. Actually, this is out of uh, one of the latest Hearth and Home magazines. It's, it's an ad that pulling a land. And this was one of the best print ads I've ever seen in my life for a hard product. I think it's incredible. Um, unfortunately, there's a glare, like my fingers in the picture. But look at this. So how, how much of a soft jab is this? So what Napoleon has done is, they, is they've showcased a baby taking their first steps. And the parents are so excited taking pictures. I mean, you can see the joy in the family. You know, I've got a 15-month-old daughter. So for me, it's like pulling on my heartstrings. For any of you guys that have had kids, I imagine it would do the same thing. The family room is where you capture life's important moments in a whole new light. Does that tell you to buy a fireplace? They're, they're making a the focus on the consumer. The fireplace is a part of it, but the fireplace is coming along and supporting what the family's already doing, right? That goes back to making them the hero and get out of the way. Um, I'm not joking. When I saw this ad, I took a picture of it and I texted it to a different company that ran a horrendous me-centered ad in that same magazine. Because this is, this is it, I, I was shocked when I saw this. The second I saw it, I mean, this is one of the best print ads I've ever seen. But the heart behind it is that <clears throat> you're getting out of the way and making the customer the focus. And, and what a way to just carefully jab away, building that brand, starting to think about the warmth and the comfort of fire, and tying that in with the most important moments in your family's life that happen in front of that. I, I, thought, that was, I thought that was just incredible. Um, okay, so, so that was good messages, right? Good messages, they give value to the consumer and they're about the consumer. Bad messages are all about you and they steal time, said everyone always. Take that to the bank. Bad messages are all about you and they steal time. So there's nothing worse than a bad message, right? I mean, how often do we all see a horrendous local TV commercial for a furniture company that looks like a five-year-old did it? My, I've seen a million of those ads, right? Mattress companies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, there's some bad ones, right? Outrageous audio. <laughs> yeah. It works, though. <laughs> yes. So you have, you have pixelated outrageous. text. It's outrageous. Pixelated text, you have a grainy video, and just terrible message delivery. And I'm always just dumbfounded thinking about how many hundred dollar bills they flush down the toilet to create and run that ad. So no one wants their time robbed from this with a bad ad. And think about this. How many of you guys have gone to read an article on your phone on ESPN.com, right? You click on the article, and all of a sudden there's a pop-up of a Jeep. And you're just like, I just want to get to my article. And you try to click on the X in the top right corner, but I've got big thumbs, and that X is so small that then I end up at Jeep.com. Do you guys feel my pain? Oh, yeah. You, yeah, okay, okay. So, that ad steals your time, and that sucks. No one wants their time stolen from them. Now, the funny thing about that is that Jeep.com probably paid three to four dollars for that click of yours, mm -hmm. and the fake impression report that they get from their SEO people with their marketing says that the ad is working. It's not. It's stealing time, and it's actually anti-marketing. I want to give another example, we'll see if this video plays, of what in my opinion is a classic time stealer. Sorry, I'll go back there. Volume power! Volume power! For the 1100 vehicles in stock, Hotsey the Ford and volume power savings now! Check out Hotsey the Ford today for volume power savings like $5,000 off your choice on 2015 Ford Edge or Focus Titanium. With Hotsey the Ford volume power savings, you'll get six pounds off the 2015 Ford <laughs> Escapes and 2015 F-150 Super Cruiser for volume power with $12,000 off. Take advantage of volume power savings today. Hotsey the Ford, the RGB truck superstore, Edinburgh. Yeah. All right, right? <laughs> Anyone go buy a truck now? No. Well, yeah, nope. but they're trying to sell 2015s no, in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> so think, think about this, though. I mean, seriously. Um, was that a consumer focus? No. no. Who was the focus on? <laughs> Volume power. <laughs> what, what, was, what was their right hook? It's price. Price, 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 right? So like we talked about earlier, when you make it about price, you commoditize yourself and you set yourself up 
to be sold against by someone that can give a better price. It's not value-based selling. You can still give a right hook and have value. But to me, that's a classic example of a time stealer. So I look at it, there's nothing worse than making an ad all about you, right? The last thing that any of us want is for a company to vomit themselves down our throats. And for me, I feel like I can care less about your company. I just want to watch the Blazer game. You know, if you can't give me value, then I don't want to see your ad because my time is worth more than that. And if you actually force your company down my throat, you might piss me off to where I actually don't buy from you because of it. Can it, do you guys have companies in the market do you poorly that you won't buy from? Like, I'll never buy a piece of jewelry from Jerry. Pure, like, I won't. I will, I've told my wife, I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm never buying you anything from there because of their horrendous marketing that has stolen my time. So we see this a lot. Business-centered marketing instead of consumer-centered marketing is lazy and it doesn't work. So when we craft a message, we need to make it about them. Don't steal people's time and don't make it all about you because it's about the consumer. Think back about that Napoleon ad, the baby taking their first steps. It's about the consumer and how we come along to support them. So next is this, is that the same message won't work for all consumers. So we need to be intentional with our messaging, right? So if we've crafted a good message, it's consumer focused, it's terrific, but Audiences are so diverse that there could be a different value proposition for different age groups, different demographics, and things like that we need to be thinking about. So the question is, how do we give value when we're advertising? Well, you craft your message for your audience. So, you know, for instance, if you're gonna to advertise to me during a Blazer game, you have to make sure, you better make sure that that value proposition is in line with what the audience thinks is important, or what I think is important. You know, in my case, nothing would give me value because I turn on the Blazer game to watch the Blazers. I hate being interrupted by apps. Um, now, on the other hand, if I flip on HGTV and I'm watching, I'm watching Fixer Upper, I mean, I go there because I like Kip and Joanne, and it gives me great ideas for my house decor. So a TV commercial that had a jab with a, maybe a design element of a fireplace, that actually might give me value because I go to that for a reason that's in line with what the messaging is. That makes sense? So in that case, if the message from your company was in line with my purpose for being there, it could give me value. As you think about crafting messages, we could try this on for size. So say that your company wants to target middle-aged single women that are uh, engaged in some kind of remodel activity, right? So think about this for messaging. You could have a woman in your company write a blog post taking someone through the steps of a remodel. Now, of course, a fireplace is a part of the remodel. This, this is a jab element. You could talk about the uncertainty up front with the unknowns of a remodel and discuss how easy the decision for a fireplace was compared to everything else. You could take them through the site visit, the install process, and then finish with an affirmation of the beauty that the finished project brought to the home and the value of that. You could have pictures every step, step of the way. So that's a really crafted ad, right? But you can post this as a blog on Facebook. You can target single women between 40 and 55 years old in whatever strategic zip code you want who are homeowners making $150,000 a year that are interested in home improvement, remodeling, and HGTV. Pretty targeted audience. And I'm not joking, for $25, you can get that ad in front of 1,800 people, 25 bucks. And if there's a woman who's struggling with the uncertainty of a remodel that's scrolling through a Facebook feed, if they see this article, it actually might give them value. They, they would be excited. It's not robbing their time. So the beauty about where we're at with the internet is that we can craft messages so specifically it's not even funny. And, you know, in theory, TV and print have these huge audiences. But in reality, how do we know who that audience is to craft a message to them? And how do we even know if they're paying attention when our message airs? We're going to talk about that more in a second. In addition, the problem with a lot of traditional marketing platforms is, number one, they're grossly overpriced. And then number two, because of the uncertainty of the audience, you have to make ads so vanilla that they become really tasteless and bland, right? How many national ads do you see for Windex? Or you have to pick whatever company it is that's marketed on a national platform. You never know who's going to be watching it, so the ad gets so blah that it's not compelling for anybody. So let's look at some specific examples of audiences. We got Mr. Hipster, millennial, right? 
I don't think I look like that. My shirt's not exactly the same. <laughs> You're definitely on different glasses. You're close, dude. <laughs> yeah, close. <laughs> so, but the key is deciding who the audience is that you're going to go after and crafting a message specifically for them. So, if you want to sell a linear fireplace to a rich millennial in downtown Portland that lives in a condo, however you deploy the ad, it better talk about how cool these fireplaces look. And it better make them the center of attention, right? With their condo is like a social mecca just looking over Portland. It needs to hit the aspects of how easy it was, right? Millennials want it easy. They want to buy in their terms. And it should talk about any cool automation features that they have in the fireplace. Now, you could take that message and you could deploy it in video form. You could do graphics. You could do print. You could do a blog post. But you've been super intentional in going after a specific audience with a specific message. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter how you deploy it, but you're crafting that message specifically for that person. Next audience piece, right? <clears throat> baby boomers. So if you're trying to sell gas inserts to baby boomers that are you know, retiring and they got some money stored away and this is, this is gonna be where, where they're gonna live out their days, I would say you probably wanna hit the ease of operation compared to a studio wood fireplace. Talk about the track record of reliability that the manufacturer has and make sure to hit the fact that your business has been serving the community since the dawn of time. I'd also think about the lifestyle aspect, the beauty and the romance, right? Baby boomers are retiring. They want the three S's. You guys know the three S's, right, in our industry? We, we, sell, we sell three things in our industry. Safety, security, and romance. <laughs> <laughs> Baby boomers want that. So, if I'm gonna sell that same gas insert, if I'm gonna sell that same gas insert to men, between 30 and 50, I'm not talking about the value points that I'm going to talk to baby boomers about. This is what I'm going to do if I'm taking that same gas insert but marketing it to men between 30 and 50. Pull another video. Oh, I know sexy. <laughs> I'm a guest in the room. I was right here in front of the fire every time it happened, but no more. Cold, kaput, out in a blaze of glory. Disgusting, dirty, high meanness, odiferous fireplace. You're not romantic anymore. I can't give you sexy all by myself. Not even in a revealing Jasmine scents. Or aphrodisiacs. Oh no. To rekindle the flame, you need to insert something sexy. <laughs> A gas fireplace insert. From <laughs> Jingle. Instant atmosphere. Instant fireworks. Instant warm all over. <laughs> Is it me in here, or is it just hot? Once again, acrobatic. In the mood to prowl. This hearth is clean and ready for love. Let it down on me, people. Mm. I, I buy that. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, that ad is ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. But. If, I, if I'm trying to sell gas sensors to men between 30 and 50, I'm running that all day long. It's okay to be edgy. Now, I'm not going to deploy that as a TV commercial where a 60-year-old woman might see it. I mean, you never know. But I'm going to find a platform of delivery that's specific. If I can find a platform of delivery specific to where I think that audience is, I would, I would hit that ad all day long. The key is that you need to start with who your audience is and then reverse engineer what will give them value. <clears throat> the dangerous part about advertising is that running ads can make you feel like you're doing something. And it's easy, I've had this happen to me, it's easy to get your chest all puffed up because you're doing something or you see yourself on TV. But the reality is that most of the money is wasted if you aren't intentional about the specific message to the specific audience. Does that make sense? Okay. Last thing, I'm going to put you guys on the spot. When you're doing marketing, track your door swings. Track your door swings. Raise your hand if you advertise. 
pretty high rate. Hands down. How many of you guys track every single door swing that you get? Every single one. Thank you. It's not many. That's a problem. For how much money is going into marketing to not pay attention to how effective it's being for you is, is not a good move. I would encourage you if there's one thing that everybody does today is start tracking every single door swing. There's so many different ways to do it. You've got to find out if this is working for you so that you can make an effective use of your money. If you aren't sure if it's going to work or not, you can write me a check and I can let you know it's not working. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at attention now, right? So that was messaging. So good messaging is all about the consumer. It gives them value. Bad messaging is all about me. And it steals their time. And then once we have our message, we need to craft it specifically against a certain audience. The same message isn't going to work for everybody. But next is going to be attention. So without attention, it doesn't matter how good your message is. It just doesn't matter. So <clears throat> I would argue that the attention piece is actually the biggest key that we have to think about. And I would actually argue that the attention piece comes before your message. You, we need to know where our customer's attention is. Do you guys know where your attention is as a consumer? You guys ever think about that? I would, I would guess that right now, if I said, hey, we're gonna take a 30 second break, you know, I'll be right back and we go get something. Um, I would guess that within 30 seconds, every single person's attention is gonna be right here. Yep. Right? Yeah. That's where our attention is. That's where we need to be marketing to. <clears throat> and if you think about that compared to traditional marketing, so think about, we'll take TV as a traditional thing, right? How many of us watch TV via Netflix, Hulu, DVR or on demand when we get home from work. It's a high percentage. That's watching TV on your terms. Now, how many of you guys, if given the opportunity, will fast forward through commercials every single time on a TV show? Every single time. Okay? Now, if you can't fast forward through the commercials, usually that's the time when you get snack, you go to the bathroom, you, uh, I don't know, make a sandwich. I mean, but you're that's, that's what you're doing, because your time is wasted watching ads like that. But if by some miracle, you stay on the couch during the commercials, and God forbid, you know, the remote falls between the cushions, and, and you are forced to, to be in the presence of that TV, I can guarantee that this is in between your face and the TV. I mean, it is. You think about Facebook, Instagram, email, Fox News, CNN, that's where our attention is. It's not on the TV commercial. Except for the Super Bowl. Super Bowl's the one exception to that, where America's attention is on the TV commercial. Um, the new Volkswagen commercial is pretty good to watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if we take another classic, um, a classic example of uh, marketing is you know the newspaper, print, clipper ads. Um, how many of you guys get the newspaper delivered to your house? One. I'm rare. Yeah. I mean, how many of you guys get your news online? Now, how many of you guys get super excited to see the banner ads at the side of OregonLive.com as you're scrolling through it? Anyone get excited about that? Anyone get excited when the Clipper magazine shows up and you're flipping through it and you see that black and white one eighth page ad in like the bottom of page seven? No one gets excited about that, right? So there's actually some studies that show that we are instinctively tuning out even the banner ads on the sides and on the top of desktop computers because they're so conditioned to being marketed to. So check out this. This is a study by so using eye tracking by the Nielsen group. And this is, this is eye tracking. Look where the attention is. The attention is on the article and there is zero eye tracking movement on the banner ads. I mean, you can get arguments from SEO people that, oh, well you got really good impressions. I could care less about that. It's not where their attention is. I don't care about it. Yeah, I don't care about that. There's better ways to brand yourself. Yeah. But that's where the attention is. The reality is that we touch our smartphone over 2,600 times a day. Over 2,600 times a day, and over half of that is on social media. Social media is not a cute thing for the kids. Gary Vaynerchuk says that social media is the current state of the internet. That's what it is. How many of you guys look at pictures of your kids and grandkids on Facebook? I do all the time. <laughs> well, not <laughs> my kids, but I'm definitely looking at pictures of my daughter on Facebook. They're so cute. She's adorable. <laughs> How many of you guys use Instagram? A few. 
one out of three adults in America does. And the fastest growing demographic on Instagram is 40 to 55 year old women. One out of three adults in America uses it, and the fastest growing demographic is 40 to 55 year old women. The fastest growing demographic on Facebook since 2014 is people over 55. This is, this is not a kid's game anymore. And that should tell us something about where our attention is. But what happens a lot of the time is that we get sucked into the scheme of the local advertising guy that's selling TV or selling radio or selling internet banner spots. But the truth is that if we measure the way we advertise against our own consumer behavior, it, it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, no one gives a crap about a TV commercial when they're watching The Voice or watching The Blazer Game. They don't go to those things we advertise to. And we could care less about the one eight page ad in the bottom of the Clipper magazine. And we're always mad when a pop-up blocks us from where we're trying to go online. So knowing that that's our behavior, we need to think about that when we decide to advertise. So we have to find where our consumer's attention is and then go there or go there on their terms. You know, looking at this, <clears throat> this, this attention is on native content, right? It's not on banner ads, it's on native content. So if you're advertising on, you know, uh, OregonLive.com, it's gonna be way better to get your company's name inside of an article that's native than have a banner ad, you know, no duh, right? If you're advertising on Facebook, make organic content that is natively inside of people's news, that's where their attention is. So next we're gonna look at overpriced attention versus underpriced attention. It might sound like I'm saying that TV and print don't work, and that's not true. Everything works. The question is just how much it costs for the return that you get, right? Overpriced attention versus underpriced attention. TV works. We all have people that have come into our stores that have seen us on TV. And print works. And despite what I say, I mean, there's some people that still get the newspaper. Billboards technically work. Home shows technically work. Everything works to some degree or another. But the question is how expensive is it for the attention that my message gets? So I want to do two broad case studies. Uh, I want to look at home shows and I want to look at network TV. So we talked home shows, I think about home shows a couple years ago at OHPPA. Um, but these are just some numbers I pulled from the Portland Home and Garden Show. I think it's a fair assessment. So say you're gonna do a home show, it's a, it's a four day home show. 925 bucks for a 10 by 10 booth, but to do it right, you need a 10 by 30. So you're at three grand for that. Natural gas, tables, drapery, everything else, $1,500 plus or minus. Usually you're dealing with two to three days set up and tear down for a two to three man crew, that's 800 bucks or so. You take a sales team of three people to work all those days and include overtime, and you're probably looking at another three grand. And then you add the cost to staff your store in their absence for those four days. That's another expense. You added fuel per diem. I mean, you're looking at close to 10 grand. And that's assuming that the product that you take makes it back in the same shape it was in. It can be sold at full price. So 10 grand, give or take, for four days. Just some cost. So how many fireplaces are you gonna sell at home show? Do we even know? I mean, if, if, we, if, you, don't track, if you don't track the foot traffic, you're, you're playing Russian roulette with that. But let's say that things are crazy and let's say you sell 10 fireplaces. I mean, maybe I'm off. I would say if you sold money down 10 fireplaces at the home show, I would call that a huge success. I would call it huge, okay? So let's say that you have the home show special of 3,500 bucks. Everyone wants a deal at the home show. This means that you are giving away a thousand dollars on each fireplace you sold. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. I'm not in the business of giving away 35% of my gross sales on a stove that already might be for sale. And that's gross, not to mention margin, right? So using that math, selling fireplaces, 3,500 bucks a piece and 40% margin, you need to sell seven fireplaces just to break even. Seven fireplaces just to break even. And when you take into account that 10 sales is optimistic for a lot of companies, the fact that it wears out your warehouse team, it wears out your sales team, and the fact that no one goes to home shows anymore to see the latest and greatest, I would say that home shows are extremely overpriced attention. Doesn't mean it doesn't work, it's just extremely overpriced. And for me, I could care less about how many advertising impressions there are, or about how you can't quantify branding or top of mind awareness. There are better ways to get those things than burning through $10,000 for a four day home show, in my opinion. 
Let's take a look at TV. So network TV, 150 to 350 bucks a spot. It's pretty normal, depending on the channel and the deal that you get. For the purpose of this, I rounded it out to 250 bucks. So how many spots do you want to run? You know, for effective TV, what I did here is, you know, two spots in the morning news, maybe Good Day Oregon or, you know, whatever uh, popular morning show there is, two spots on the 6 p.m. news, and you do one spot on the 8 p.m. or the late night news, right? It's a pretty good TV campaign. So if you want to run that Monday through Friday for 12 months, you're looking at $325,000. And, you know, so that's crazy. I never, you know, five days, two, I only advertise three days a week, okay? $195,000, three days of TV for a year. At two days a week, it's still gonna cost you $130,000 for just two days a week of TV. The math doesn't get better as you break it down. And how many sales do you get on that, you know? I mean, 12 months of TV is super expensive, and so we better be selling a ton of fireplaces, and we better be tracking our door swings, because that's way too much money to go out the window without knowing if it's working. Traditional marketing says on average to use three to four percent of gross sales for your marketing. So, if you ran TV for 12 months, three days a week, 195 grand, means you better be selling six and a half million dollars on the stoves every year, assuming you do no other marketing. It's a lot of fireplaces. So, to back up, I'm not saying that TV doesn't work. TV does. It's just really, really expensive and it doesn't have a consumer's attention. If we think about it, we're on the verge of a marketing shift and the TV is becoming the radio and this is becoming the TV. That's where we're going. So let's look at some alternatives um, on what I would consider to be underpriced attention. So number one is Facebook. Facebook's right here. Um, I can take that same $10,000 for the home show, right? The four, day, the four day home show. I can spread it over 12 months on Facebook where I can target people based on age, zip code, income, and interests. And I can get that in front of 60,000 people each month for 12 months for what it costs me to do one home show. I can craft video ads at no charge or I can write some insightful blog posts, maybe get some amazing before and after pictures and a photo gallery and I can specifically target different customers for 97% less than the cost of running five days a week TV per year, 97% less. To me, that's a, that's a good number. It's, that's underpriced attention. If we, if we all say that we all use Facebook, I mean, Facebook's got over a billion people that use it, you can target so specifically and it costs you virtually nothing, I mean, that's underpriced. Another one's Pinterest, right here. Anyone use Pinterest? Mostly ladies, but I'm sure there's some guys too. So, you know, people, people go to Pinterest for visual inspiration. And what's better than a fireplace for that, right? I mean, the reason they go there is to see products like ours. It's like, that's a, if that's not a value proposition, I don't, I don't know what is. So use some incredible pictures of your finished installs and target them against the demographic that you want. And think about this with Pinterest. If people like your idea enough and they pin it, and that's gonna to start to grow you exponentially if you actually have some really cool stuff. It's gonna spread. YouTube. YouTube's right here. So YouTube, it literally costs you nothing to make a decent YouTube video. So I made that promotional video for the OHPBA conference. I tried to find every member in our, in our uh, group and actually send it to each one of you guys on Facebook. I don't know who saw it and who didn't. But, um, you know, that was a, it wasn't a great video, but it wasn't a bad video. It was free. It took me three and a half minutes to make. Um, and I sent it out, and now it lives forever on the internet. So if in five years someone loves it and it blows up, I'm still gonna get the credit for that. You know, you can, you can use YouTube to throw so many jabs to educate consumers about cool things and to set your company up as the one that teaches them. YouTube is also the second biggest search engine in the world outside of Google, YouTube is. Maybe there's some opportunity there. The cost is still too low not to use it. Instagram, right here. Instagram, this is the biggest mistake that I see in our industry, is that no one is on Instagram. And when they are, most people are using it wrong. If you're a manufacturer and you're not on Instagram, you've gotta be ashamed of yourself, period. One out of three adults in America on Instagram it is the most visual platform out there, and it is the perfect platform for telling a story and building a brand. If you go on Instagram, 
I'm assuming you guys know what that is. If not, come talk to me. But when you go on Instagram, everything is visually based. And it's the perfect jab platform. Now, Instagram is not necessarily set up well for right hooks. And there's nothing worse than a fireplace company that throws up an Instagram post and says, well, it's, you know, it's cold outside, but it's warm at Gypsy Handle Fireplace Shop, so come on down and save $700 this weekend. It's horrible. No one wants to see that on Instagram. They don't go there for that. But it's the place to tell your story. So if you're a mom and pop business, or if you have a story of someone, an employee profile you can do, someone just come up through the ranks, you can deploy that on Instagram and people get excited about it. The other day I was talking with an unnamed manufacturer that wasn't on Instagram. I was telling them what a horrendous mistake it was. Because under the fireplace hashtag on Instagram, I checked it like a week and a half ago, there's like 2.3 million pictures under the fireplace hashtag. Like people are posting about fireplaces and people are searching through that. What if your company was one of the sweet pictures? You know, Instagram is, I would, I would not go for paid ads on Instagram. I mean, I would throw everything at paid ads on Facebook. I would not do that on Instagram because it's so easy to build it organically. You can, you can build it for nothing and start to gain some huge credibility. Um, if you're a manufacturer with a national audience, it is inexcusable not to be throwing everything you have at developing an Instagram presence because that's actually gonna send people to look for your dealers because they're getting design ideas and aspirations from your product. Okay, so each one of these, in my opinion, is an example of underpriced attention, but the reality is it's not gonna stay underpriced, right? How many of us run Google AdWords? Google AdWords used to be a lot less expensive than they are now. Didn't used to be X amount of dollars for a fireplace. You know, three to five dollars, depending on how good your SEO is. Didn't used to be like that. It used to be five cents, ten cents. The same thing is going to happen with this. It's where our attention is. Some of the big brands are starting to make that shift. It hasn't happened yet. And when it does, these costs are going to skyrocket. So we got to take advantage of the walls under price. Now, as you see prices climbing, we can be paying attention to where the attention trends of our customer are going. But it's a learning game. You never arrive. It's always a learning game to see where that attention is. Um, one thing to clarify is that I'm not against TV, I'm not against drive time radio, I'm not against billboards or home shows, I just think they're really expensive. So if someone wants to give me a home show booth and set it up for me, I'll send a couple of salespeople there all day, right? If someone wants to biz dev with me and, and set that up, I'll send a team to staff it, that's no problem. I'll take that, it's underpriced attention. You know, if the Oregonian wants to give me a front page ad for a thousand bucks, I'll buy a week's worth, perfect, you know? Uh, if, I, if drive time radio seems to have my consumer's attention, if I feel like in a crowded, noisy world, drive time radio is actually a time that they're focused, like, I'll do it. I'll even deploy TV, maybe a $25,000 TV push. But when I do it, I'm tracking everything. It's intentional and on purpose. It's not just, oh, this will be done, so we're gonna, we're gonna keep doing it. Now, with all this attention, overpriced attention, underpriced attention, none of it matters if your message sucks. This only takes you to the front door. Because if you don't get to the front door, you don't even get a chance. So next is the question, what's your plan? Failing to plan is planning to fail. Any of your moms tell you that? <laughs> so here's what I would argue. I would say to start with, when you form a plan, is you have to get educated and you can't stop because it's always a moving target. So you have to be a student of the game. So we should always be studying where people's attention is and how they're using current technology to consume information. We need to pay, be paying attention to brands that tell great stories and, and also companies that throw great right hooks, right? I've been all over that pulling that, taking a look and thinking about, gosh, why is that brilliant? How can I deploy something like that in the same brilliant way? I've been looking at that Trump ad being like, that's awesome. It's so unashamed of throwing a right hook. When I throw a right hook, I'm going to be at least self-aware when I do it. <clears throat> now, it's easy to say this, looking at Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook, looking at all that stuff. It's easy to say, well, I don't know how to run an Instagram ad. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to run a Facebook campaign. I don't know how to do that stuff. I'm not joking. I have found the most incredible website, and I want to give it to you guys. This <laughs> website has transformed everything I've done. It'll teach you exactly how to do it. You ready? www.g o o g l e dot com. You guys heard of that? You guys heard of that? Yeah. If you go to that and you punch in, how do I run a Facebook ad? You will get tons of articles. You'll get YouTube videos showing you how to do it. I mean, the information is there. It is totally there. We just have to educate ourselves. 
Now, what we need to do is realize that as we're educating ourselves, things are always changing. We're never going to have it all figured out, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be learning because this is your money, right? This is the lifeblood of your business. In the same way we talked about the financial advisor analogy earlier, like, man, it's your money. So you may not know more than the marketing person you're using, but you better know enough to make sure what you're doing is being effective. I want to throw out three resources in all seriousness. Number one is a Google search. I would, I would argue in four to six hours worth of work on Google and YouTube, you are gonna know everything you need to know to get started. I'm not joking. I would in a heartbeat after this go buy the book, Jab, 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 Right Hook by Gary Vaynerchuk. He's brilliant. If you haven't heard of him, you need to be paying attention to this guy. If you're a manufacturer and you're doing keynote speeches, he's unbelievably expensive and he will change your company. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm saying is just 100% ripped off from him. He's brilliant. Also, get on your iTunes podcast app. Just search for the top business podcasts in the iTunes stores. It's worth taking a survey of those. There's so much free content. You don't have to pay a ton of money to, to get educated, to buy ebooks or classes or anything. The information is right there. So next is this. So you're going to make a plan. So you need a budget, you need a schedule, and then you need to know the platforms that you're going to use, right? So once you've done your research, you got to take that time, make the plan. It's important to look at your year and decide what the key times are for that messaging that we talked about. So decide how your message and how your delivery will work with the products that you're trying to push, and then look specifically at the different audiences that you're trying to hit. Set aside a dollar amount that is the marketing investment for the company, right? Three to five percent gross sales is a great place to start. So use that for the year, break it up quarter by quarter. Take a look at what money you want to spend on each platform. That's, as you do that and you start to track your door swings, you're really going to start to gauge whether your marketing is in line with the amount that you sell. So you divide that money up by times of the year and then divide it up by platforms, right? So do it on a quarter by quarter basis. You don't, you don't make all your decisions at once, but you know, maybe you dedicate 35% to Facebook and you do 50% to TV and maybe you do 15% to business development with other, with other businesses. I, I would call that marketing. So once you've decided on the platforms you'll use, take some time to brainstorm how you're gonna storytell with each one. Because you're gonna communicate differently on Facebook than TV, right? On a TV ad where you've got so much money on the line, you're probably throwing a right hook. But on Instagram, where it doesn't cost you anything, you're building credibility, it's gonna be a different message for that consumer. It's probably gonna be a jab, not a haymaker. And it's not difficult, it's just you being intentional. So as you do this though, make sure no matter what to be incorporating organic Facebook and Instagram content, organic, not paid for. It's free, it just takes a schedule. But make sure you're thinking about the value proposition. I have been guilty and my company has been guilty in not utilizing Facebook properly, making it all about us. That's something that we wanna change, make it about the consumer. And think about yourself as a consumer, what would give you value if you were scrolling through the Facebook feed in an organic search? So, set aside the budget, schedule the year out, and decide on the platforms and the messages that you're gonna to leverage to your customers. It's not, it's not hard, it just takes a little bit of planning. Last step, execute. So don't let the fear of failure or the obsession with perfection stop you. This is the key to everything. You know, how often have you guys been inspired by a conference or a book or a podcast, but failed to do anything about it? Yeah, I mean, we all have, right? It happens. But don't let yourself get so bogged down in the details of this that you actually miss out on executing the plan. You never get 100% right, that's all right, it's okay. So as you plan and execute, plan and execute, plan and execute, again and again and again, you're gonna start to get the hang of it. And as you analyze your door swings and your engagement levels, you're gonna start to see trends and realize what works and what doesn't work. So it doesn't take much to become an expert, it takes some real world experience, a little bit of education, and you guys can do it. You just have to execute. It's easy to feel intimidated with all the platforms out there, but again, you can't let the fear of failure or an obsession with perfection derail you from even trying. You know, marketing effectively and, and deciding on well, what social platform am I gonna use and just all that stuff, you can only read about it for so long. And after that, you just gotta jump in. So taste and see what works, because eventually you're gonna get it. It's just a little bit of practice. Okay, in summary, remember the formula. Your message plus their attention equals marketing. Nothing more, nothing less. Your message plus their attention. 
So marketing doesn't work if your product sucks, but that's not most of us, frankly. I mean, we have great products. So have fun and take pride in showing off your business to people. I mean, we've all built businesses that we're super proud of and we think are the best. And so we, it should be a joy to communicate that to our consumer. I mean, what's more fun than sharing the story of a brand that you love and believe in, right? So I think we should be jumping and do it. Form a plan, budget, schedule, but be taking a look at that overpriced attention versus underpriced attention. And if you want to, as an example, feel free to email me. Um, I would love to talk examples of places that market well and also market poorly. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good conversation to pay attention to, to who's doing it right, see what we can learn from that. And that's all I have, thank you guys. All right.